if you have the ability to see, and I'll post it again in the, in the group chat, um, I explain a little bit about how to do this if you're, if you're new to doing this with us. I know a lot of you have done this a couple times with us already, but uh, ideally uh, you raise your hand and you raise your blue hand by going to uh, the button at the bottom. Um, and I believe it's under the participants button where you see that option or under, is it under? Yeah, see, depending on what system you're using it on, you'll be able to find that you raise your blue hand and then I will call on you and unmute you or you can unmute yourself at that point and, uh, and we'll go for it. Um, I posted in the chat uh, a little bit about our authors tonight. Uh, tonight we are talking about Watchmen. I'm Jeff, by the way, welcome to Books and Bars. Uh, we're talking about Watchmen by uh, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. Uh, came out in 1986, 87. Um, I wouldn't admit this to a lot of people, but I'll admit to you right now, I was reading comics back in 86, 87. And uh, I've read this three times over the course of my life. And it's been different every single time I've read it. Uh, and I've changed my thoughts about it um, dramatically over the different, I've read it over different decades. Uh, most recently, um, just in the last few months, along with the TV show, uh, watching that on HBO and to talk about it here with you guys. So um, really excited to hear your thoughts on it. I know for a lot of us, it might be the first time that you've read it and uh, maybe you're not even as much of a comic person or the only ones you read are the ones you do with books and bars, which I love and I hope to do at least one a year, continue with you guys. And we have um, a great group of people in here tonight. So I'd love to see your hand, your blue hand raised and then I will uh, call on you to hear what you think about Watchmen. I would love to hear um, if anyone wants to kick us off tonight with maybe you just finished it today uh, and you have a really fresh take on it. Um, you're, you're reading it through the lens of, of quarantine and COVID-19 and you just finished it because you were forced to be at home today. Does anyone, does anyone want to raise their hand and tell us uh, what they thought of it? And let me see if I can see your hands. I just lose that stuff. And Angela is going to be helping us with our chat. So part of it also is the um, is the extended uh, conversation that's happening in the chat. Uh, it's usually quite robust. So where are my participants? And I see Angela, you have your hand up. Literally finished it two hours ago. Awesome. Thanks for getting and it done in time. I know. I bought it and handed it off to Katie because I was finishing all the rest of the lock and keys uh, series. And then uh, I got it back from her. And honestly, it took me a while because I struggled. I felt like it was really like segmented, disconnected. And even though all the characters like looped together, I just wasn't following it. And the weird little inserts of random stuff in between. I guess it's just not my jam. And I don't normally do like graphic novels. Uh, I'm, I've enjoyed all the other ones we've done. This one was not doing it for me. You know, it's, I don't think it's an easy read. I definitely, I definitely understand that um, wh where you're coming from on there. And after reading it this third time with the perspective of books and bars reading it, I did get a little nervous um, because I felt at a certain point, um, and I, I, tell me if I'm wrong, but I would love to hear from, is this really something that um, does it work better for you if you have an, a certain appreciation or knowledge or love of um, the genre already, especially the superhero genre. And I'm wondering if you don't come to it with that, is this kind of a cold, more distant sort of thing? Um, but I see Craig's hand is up and I would love to hear what he thinks. Craig, you're unmuted. Talk to me. Um, yeah, so I finished yesterday. It's the second time I've read it. Um, and as far as like uh, fitting in with like the current times of COVID and whatnot, I kind of thought, um, well, going straight to the ending, um, like I, while I was thinking about this giant monster that was created to basically uh, reset the uh, doomsday clock or whatever, um, basically I'm like, okay, so we're in this worldwide pandemic right now. How are things, I mean, things are going to change when we get out of this. Like how drastic will it be? Like what, you know, how is the world going to be just a different place when we're done? And uh, I don't know, that kind of tied in with uh, the drastically different world at the end of the Watchmen. 
Uh, Craig, I would love to know if you have any thoughts about how the world will be different and if there's anything we can do right now to prepare for that. Um, yeah, so it will. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, everybody's, well, everybody who can, everybody who's lucky enough to be able to um, can work from home right now. And I, I mean, I know like what Twitter just the other day, they were just like, when this is over, you guys can still work from home. I think there was going to be a lot less going into the office in general. Um, for people who do, at least in the near term, I think it's going to be a lot different, um, you know, because like there still will be social distancing. But um, even after that, like um, so many people have kind of shown, hey, we can do our work from home. There's no reason to go into the office. Uh, I, I don't know, are downtown smaller then? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, the, a scarier thought that I had from reading this during this time was if Richard Nixon can have a fifth term, you know, oh, no. I mean, who knows how many, who, who knows how many uh, 45 is going to go for. I, I'm just, I'm just saying, watch out for that. Things can be changed. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, you have your hand up. I've unmuted you. Talk to me. Hi. Um, so I read this a long, long time ago and I remember loving it, but something I hadn't remembered until recently when I just read it yesterday and today was how interesting a lot of the coloring is. Um, so yes. shout out to John Higgins, who is not actually on the cover of the book, uh, who is the colorist for this. And I think one thing that you might not, um, might not be as obvious if you haven't read a lot of superhero books is how often they use a lot of primary colors. And in this, exactly. it's predominantly like a lot of teals, a lot of purples, a lot of oranges, um, especially in like, really harsh lighting and all the costumes. Um, so that's something that I've, rereading it, really actually thought was the best part of it, was just the coloring. Uh, excellent point, and I'm glad you bring that up because I, I had read that, that, yes, that Higgins intentionally wanted to work with secondary colors primarily. And I think you see it um, really well in the way he de depicts Mars. Uh, and I think it's really fun um, that that whole issue with Dr. Manhattan and, and Laurie talking on Mars. And um, one of my other favorites as far as the coloring and, and Dave Gibbons artwork goes is um, the uh, chapter five of Fearful Symmetry. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but the entire uh, chapter five is a symmetrical in like a palin palindrome. Uh, it's really interesting, especially if you have a paper copy now and you want to flip through and kind of look at chapter five and look at the first page, the last page, second page, second to the last page, and see how it converges into the very middle with that, that staged fight with Adrian Veidt. And it's perfectly, it, it's, it's so beautiful the way it's done. And um, since then, um, a bunch of other comics have copied that format and they'll, you'll see like an, a tribute issue where it's done in this, in this Watchmen symmetrical way. Another thing along while we're on the art is um, if you notice the nine panel grid uh, on many of the pages, uh, it's, it's a style that um, really allows you, you know, much smaller squares. There's not a lot of large splash pages. There's not a lot of, you know, what you might expect from comics, the very big, you know, large art pictures, but there are these small kind of frames that let you focus in on the different details. I see uh, Kara's got her hand up. Let me unmute her. Kara, talk to us. Hey, um, this is kind of going back to your first question about like, uh, do you need to like superhero comics to enjoy this? Yes. Um, I love superhero comics and I hate hated this. <laughs> yeah. um, Fair enough. It depends on like what you like about superheroes. Like if you think that superheroes are, are cool, then maybe this is like a cool reconstruction, but I like superhero comics, like I like Superman and I like, you know, Captain America. I like the optimistic ones where, you know, sometimes things are hard, but you still do the right thing. And like, I don't know, I don't have a lot of optimism in real life. So I guess when it comes to um, literature, I like escapist stuff and it can still be dark, you know, sometimes the best things happen when, you know, the hero's at his lowest or he's really being put through a test or she's being put through a test. And it can be dark and depressing, but I think the Watchmen, or just Watchmen, is so nihilistic, and um, I find it deeply unpleasant to read most of it. Um, um, I really like yeah. her when, like, Dr. Manhattan's talking about thermodynamic miracles, and that's, like, the most optimistic, kind of hopeful part of the book to me. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. Excellent points. And I mean, I think what's interesting is I think people that maybe um, there, there are some people that have placed Watchmen on a pedestal for what might not be the best reason. Um, I think when you look at a character like Rorschach, um, he, to me, is like the Joaquin Phoenix Joker type of character. He's not someone that you should like necessarily admire uh, and put up there. These aren't, these aren't, yeah, these, this is not Captain America. This is not Superman. These are not people that you put and say, I, you know, these are not role models. You know, this, this is this idea of um, if there were people that dressed up and went out and were vigilantes, they're supposing that maybe there would be something slightly psychologically wrong with them um, to want to do this and to do this. And that if there was a Batman-like character, like a, he wouldn't necessarily be Bruce Wayne he would probably be more like Kovacs here, you know, a person that is, has been, you know, has, I mean, Batman's got, obviously, we know his origin, we've seen it a million times, but um, I, I think, yes, it does, it definitely is a very dark, depressed <laughs> version of it, and uh, I think when, if you read this as a, as a younger person, I, well, I can only, I'll speak for myself, you read this as like a teen boy, in the Midwest, you might think it's cool and you don't get the nuances or the level of this. And, you've, and you might even like think, you know, Rorschach is really cool. Maybe you even saw Ted Cruz was asked, politician Ted Cruz was asked who his favorite superheroes were a while back. And he had Rorschach in his top <sighs> five. And a lot of people were like, hold on a second. Did you even read that? Do you understand what you're saying? And then I think they were, they just kind of like brushed it under the table. Cause he had like Wolverine and Spider-Man and stuff in there too. But the fact that he had Rorschach in his top five, people were like, hold on a second. Do we need to like investigate this a bit further? Um, yeah, it's definitely dark and depressing. And I think Dr. the Dr. Manhattan um, aspect of it, you bring up where he, you know, he actually has to find, is there even a reason for, um, any good in humanity? Like, what's the point? Um, and he kind of comes to this idea of, um, like, Laurie kind of tells him how it, it's, it's that we're, you know, unpredictable and unknowable and that there is, there's some mystery. But like, for him, everything is, there's, there's no free will for him. You know, he sees the past, present, and future all at the same time. So he has a hard time seeing the point of any of it. But I got Pete's hand up here. Let me get to Pete. Pete, oh, you're unmuted. Talk hey. to us. Hey, nice seeing hey. all the familiar faces. Um, yeah, because so uh, I came at this. I read the original twelve when they came out. Like this was shortly after I graduated college, and I grew up on comic books in the '60s and '70s. And and we read, um, we we were reading them in college. And uh, to uh, uh, the previous point made, um, this. Uh, when this came out, it was such an innovation and it was like, it was so dark, you know, for, uh, for comics. We were just, we were really surprised and then yep. uh, went with it and it went in wildly different directions than we all expected at the time. Because, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned Rorschach because um, I don't know if I would hold him as a favorite superhero, but I, I think he's a great, interesting character because yeah, um, he's ultimately the one that's the most ethical of of all of them, and 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 the uh, or maybe the comedian too because he was he was tortured by what he had to do, and then when he found out that the whole thing was a sham and how it whether he, whether he was uh, you know it's a tough thing with like with Doctor Manhattan whether he was actually murdered or he was in this uh, necessity he was an, a casualty that had to happen but it was really um the whole story was just nuts and then Rorschach with his line of when he's in prison that uh that you, you think I'm stuck in here with you you're stuck in here with me and he goes and kills a bunch of them that's not exactly the kind of justice system that I'm really rooting for but emotionally it was satisfying at the time and then, uh, but then when it got put together as a graphic novel, um, uh, uh, bought that one too, and um, and that was cool. But I think the thing about the whole the the show that I would uh, is a good discussion topic uh, is that um, 
it does what sci-fi does really well is that it gets us thinking about um, we you re you really when you look at this universe I much prefer a justice system that actually functions and I really wouldn't want to live in a universe with these characters I um, I I don't want superheroes I just want um, you know functioning government and I don't want five terms in Nixon <laughs> and um, uh, the uh, and yeah it's just kind of and it was it's just it was right there with the x-men that's how i plugged into it because they're always in all the old x-men and and i guess some of the movies they're they're always discussing whether uh the x-men should be around at all are they a threat are they an asset and it it's great sci-fi but you know we're better off on our own than we're having uh, some superhero come in and solve it for us in my opinion well, Pete, I will, uh, I guess I'm not going to be putting on my costume tonight and going out. That's probably fine. Um, Good, I don't have to follow for, you around. Yeah, I've had great <laughs> use for my masks, though, lately. It's really worked out for me. Uh, you know, I'm already halfway there. But, but uh, thanks, Pete. Uh, Katie, you have your hand up. You're unmuted. Talk to us. Katie? Katie? I'm here now. <laughs> okay. Bueller, can you hear me? Um, so I have been okay with the graphic novels we've read in the past. They were interesting and easy to follow. And yeah, Vision was great. Um, Lock and Key was good. I just finished watching the series. I binged that this weekend. Didn't track with the, the book very well, but uh, it was well done. Um, this book, however, drove me bonkers. Um, I couldn't get into it. I read it slower than I've read a book in a while. Um, I didn't like how all over the place it was. I really was not a fan of the person at the newsstand reading a comic within us reading a comic book. Cause I'm like, I'm reading two books here and this is annoying. Um, plus I didn't get anything of use from the little comic book that he was reading at the same time I was reading the main comic book like it did nothing for me so I was really frustrated it was hard to follow I it didn't capture me in the way that like vision did or lock and key like I didn't want to keep reading it um and as far as like the the visual aspect of it like it was too dark. Like everything was so drab and dreary and dark. And I know that has to do with the story and the characters, but it was, it was too much. It was too down. Like everything about this book was down and dreary and dark and depressing. <laughs> well, um, yes, Dan and Lori sort of, you know, find happiness together at the end and you know, there's uh, maybe a little bit of, um, could you say, uh, America and Russia, you know, USA and Russia coming together because only 3 million people had to die in New York. Is that, you know, could we take the bright side of that? You know, we stopped the world from ending by only having 3 million people die because of a squid. You know, I mean, there's just, you know, there's just you know, some things to think about. Um, but I hear you. It's, uh, it's definitely not um, a happy one. And I think, um, you know, when you, you take the smiley face and you have blood dripping down it on the front. It's, it's kind of pre-warning you. And I think we're back to Jeff picks dark books for us, right? I mean, he's here to depress us. He, uh, he wants the books to bring you down so much that you actually think he's funny on video <laughs> or in person. And you laugh at his jokes because it's got to be better than the book that you just read, which brought you down so much. Am I right? Am I right? It's a, it's a, it's a trade-off there. No, well, I totally hear I... you. I, I hear you, Katie. I understand. Well, and I watched the movie years ago when it first came out and that was fairly dark and I know it has to be different because of Hollywood and um, content and time frame and whatnot, but the book was very different, very different from the movie for me. So the movie actually, uh, the Zack Snyder film from uh, 2009, 
is very I thought I thought really similar to the movie. Like some of the shots are um, some of the exact panels. It was very uh, similar to it. He does change the. Um, there isn't a, a squid uh, in the end. It's uh, they blame Doctor Manhattan for all of it. Like Doctor Manhattan caused um, all those deaths in in New York. That said, um, I know it's a stretch, but the show, the Watchmen HBO show, um, takes this story and these characters and it moves 30 years into the future. So it's set in like our current time and it's slightly different just the way this 85 is slightly different than our 85 was. Um, really interesting. So if you put in the work and you didn't like this, I'm going to say you still might like the HBO show, which I thought was really, really well done. Um, and if you're at all interested in seeing, and I, I'm not saying it, it's, there's still some darkness to this show, but I, I think you might get a little bit of a reward um, if you're at all interested in, in continuing. I'm just going to throw that out there, but I get it if you're not. Kevin's had his hand up for a while. I got to, got to unmute Kevin. Talk to me. This is a real hand this time, he said. This is a real hand. Yes, this is a real hand, not this right now. <laughs> so uh, my life probably has some parallels to yours, Jeff. I grew up here in the Midwest, and uh, I read this. I'm over 40 now, but I read this when I was a teenager. And uh, the and I saw the movie, too. Um, yeah, so <laughs> similar. The, That's for being uh, over 40. Yeah, you know, I mean, <laughs> whatever. It is what it is, but. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I'd rather be <laughs> anyway, whatever the, I do. A, so I didn't really love this. I didn't, I didn't love it. Um, but I think I can, I can appreciate it a lot more. I can appreciate it as a, for sure. than when I was young, like I can appreciate the politics of it. I can appreciate the artistry of it. I can appreciate how, how the concepts, uh, tie together. And yeah, having somebody with, I think that one of the earlier comments, uh, comments was about Rorschach having integrity, but, um, or maybe it wasn't integrity, but it was, uh, he's certainly, he's certainly very focused. He certainly has his own ethics and he abides by those. Um, and I can, I can, I can appreciate that as a character. Um, and so it did bring, even though I didn't care for it right now, I know, I think you, I think you picked it before the pandemic. I think it was, I think you picked it early <laughs> and, uh, to read it at this time, it was yeah, it was a little heavy. Yeah, it was a little heavy, but uh, um, but it was interesting, and I got a lot out of it, and I appreciated it differently. And so I would just, I just, I do think it does bring a lot to the table. It brings a lot of different. You can, you know, it brings a lot of philosophy. It brings a lot of. It does have a lot to talk about. So I, I do appreciate it. Well, thanks, Kevin. And yes, it was picked pre-pandemic. Uh, we uh, we had our books selected through. Um, through the seven and a half deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle uh, before the pandemic. And then these, these bonus uh, books, the ones that have happened uh, later in the month uh, are being added um, during the pandemic. And I'd like to continue with twice a month if possible. Um, so yeah, anything, anything picked. Um, so Circe was by Madeline Miller is in July and that was, has long been on the list it wasn't officially picked until during the pandemic, but it's out of paperback now, so we can do it. But moving forward, yes, I will. I will have a, that also that lens of picking that, and that's why um, I'm having you guys vote on a lot of them too. So if you want something that's you know different than the pandemic, that said, I have the itch to reread Station Eleven during this. I don't know what it is, but like I'm almost wanting to steer into it and and read something that that relates to it also. So. Um, it, it depends. I get it. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot here and, uh, and I'm open to whatever aspects of this that you guys want to talk about. So keep raising your hand. And, uh, the more, you know, we go with what you guys want to talk about better than just going off of my notes. So Ashley Crone, welcome back. I'm unmuting you. Good to see you. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'm really excited. Hey, uh, this is like really nice socialization, even though it's through a screen, I miss people. Um, I totally get why people probably didn't like it, but it also really bums me out. So like I read this for the first time maybe 10 years ago. Um, and prior to that, my only real experience with comics and like graphic novels was reading Archie comics. Does anybody remember? Awesome. Like yeah. when I would go to the grocery store with my mom because I was the youngest, I'm like a girl, whatever. Um, and my reward every week was to get like a new Archie comic. And my brothers read like everything else, right? And they're like, oh, whatever, Archie. So 
when somebody told me to read this 10 years ago, I was like, oh yeah, I haven't like read comics in a while, whatever. Um, and I fucking loved it. <laughs> and I don't remember the exact details why I loved it, but I literally read it and was like, I'm ruined. I, I literally just read the best one. Well, where do I have to go from here? And then I read like V for Vendetta right after it. And I was like, oh, this is it's just like too much. But I don't know. I, I totally understand the like during the pandemic, like it's super dark. And for me, like I usually read a shit ton and I have only been able to read four books in the last two months. And this wasn't one of them. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but I, to I totally get that. Like, I really feel like the time and place you're in when you read something absolutely affects how, how, how something like resonates or whether you like it or not. But oof. yeah, I... I think I would have a similar reaction to everyone else had I been able to like reread it or read it now for the first time. Cause it's just, it's so much, right? But if you're wanting to lean into it and you're looking for a regular book, the one of the the trilogy out of the four books that I read was N.K. Jemisin's Broken Earth. Didn't we, did we read that earlier, like a few months ago and I missed out on it? Yeah. 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 That was the only one that like those three books plus like Nora McInerney's Bad Moms. Those are the only books I've read in the last two months. Well, uh, if I can put a plug in for um, our book in two weeks, uh, I am absolutely loving Recursion by Blake Crouch. Maybe you read uh, Dark Matter with us. Uh, I know some of you did. Um, it's fantastic. It's, it's really exciting. And, and I would classify it as a romp if you guys are looking for a romp. Um, it's, it's, really, it's really great. Um, and a fun way to get more books done, I mentioned this before, but if you have them, Rachel and I will walk the dog and we each have one of these in one ear and we'll listen to a book together while we walk. Sure, we're not talking during that time, but we're both listening to the same book and then we can talk about it after. It's great. She did not read Watchmen though, so she's not with us today. And I'm not getting notes from other places of the house saying, let me in, because everyone's in the meeting, so that's good. Well, Ashley, uh, thank you again. And thanks again for those Choose Your Own Adventure books, which uh, when I posted that the other day, people got really excited and now they wanna borrow all of my Choose Your Own Adventure books. Um, all right, Lisa, your hand is up and you're unmuted. Talk to us. She's not unmuted. I know. You know, here's what's funny. I try to unmute the person. I think they're trying to unmute themselves and then we both start muting each other. I think she's you should unmuted unmute, now, am I right? Yeah, you should unmute them and then say you're unmuted and say their name. Can you hear us now? Yeah. Thank you, Angela, Lisa, are you, are you ready now? Can you hear us now? Yeah. yeah. Yay. Can you hear me, Jeff? <laughs> yes, not but Lisa. but but I expect at least his voice, not Andrew's. Well, yes. we, lo we logged in together so that we we're, were trying something new, adorable. togetherness during books and bars. You know what? I think the couple that Zooms together is a couple that stays together. So sure. keep it up, yeah, guys. We'll go with that. Uh, so um, I uh, really appreciate you picking this, uh, this one. I uh, have typically not liked the uh, graphic novels in the past. Absolutely love them. Absolutely loved this one. I thought it was uh, a real tour, tour de force. Um, I found myself um, really engrossed in it and um, spending a lot more time than I would on any of the previous uh, uh, novels, trying to figure out the little clues that are left in there. Loved the alternate uh, universe piece. Really liked um, some of the internal play on the comic book hero. For So early on, one of the things that's easy to forget is that they um that, that that comic books kind of inspire the vigilantes in the watchmen and that's the that's where the alternative universe splits off from our own is that people read superman comic books and captain america and these sort of things and they they emulate they emulate the the uh um the comic book heroes themselves and go vigilante and um, that's kind of the point where things where things split um, in the in the in the two universes. And it's real interesting because there's a portion in there where they go from super superheroes become so passe because there's these people running around the Minutemen and all says that they switch over to to pirate comics are the, the all of the rage, which is the comic then that you're that you're reading yes. along, alongside of that, um, which was kind of the, the, the tour de force of the pirate comic that was so dark 
that uh, you know that that you know it was it was a little too far afield for the comic book readers of the day. It was almost poking fun at itself, like you know, you know we've, we you know you've got all of these pirate farces, and then suddenly you've got a guy you know <laughs> scrapping together a raft on the bodies of his his old shipmates and going crazy and killing his whole town and you know then joining the nasty pirates themselves. I thought it was wonderful. It was, uh, it was just a really, really um, in-depth book. And uh, um, in comparison to the, I, I agreed that I'm probably ruined now. I didn't like the other one, <laughs> the, other, the other graphic novels. <laughs> and now I know that it can be done this well. Well, <laughs> well, you know what? I kind of, I, um, so I think the tough, the tough part about it is it is so highly regarded. It is so, um, you know, considered to be, you know, the pinnacle of the form, or at least the first to do so many of these things, and it changed the comic industry, that um, I think sometimes if you read it with knowing all of that, it works against it. And, uh, and I, I really, I think I felt at a certain point, I, ke I kept wanting to do one comic a year, at least with you guys. And I don't know, maybe it was the reaction from the last one to the last two that I was like, and, and coupled with the HBO show, I was just like, okay, if you don't like this one, I don't know what else to tell you. I, I got to try it. We we'll do it here. I know it's going to be a tough discussion, but uh, this I is gave the you, a you know big thumbs up. I gave you a big thumbs should up have, on, the, yeah. on the TV show. So yeah, thanks. I, I I think everyone should check that out too. Um, but uh, Andrew, I'm glad this was the one that that you finally liked. I'm sorry I didn't like the other ones, but yeah, it'll be my goal to find another one, and I think I will be able to if you like this one. Another one that you'll like. I, it's out there. We'll get it. But Rachel G. <laughs> Your hand is up. Hi. Um, How's it going? I just saw that you asked for Icebreaker, and I had to look up the author, but I really like Persepolis. It was one of the early oh, ones yeah. that I read. It's great. Uh, I'm going to butcher her name, but Mar Marjan Satrafi. She's French and Iranian, so that's... Excellent I'm book. Not great at that, but um, it's, it's really interesting. And, you know, I know this is... <laughs> A little a little older so you know to consider that too but like female characters in this oof, duh, are just uh i mean laurie is awful her mom is not great either and uh you know even the the psychologist's wife is like flies off the handle when he just wants to talk about work or have you know do a challenge at work and i'm not trying to bring up female stuff all the time but this is the second time I read it. I, I enjoy it. It's just like, it really struck me this time how awful all the female characters are. And oof, it's just, yeah, I don't know. So I bring that, but the, the other point, because I read it a second time, I think I appreciated those, the interplay of the pirate comic scenes with the, with the what's going on in the world scenes. And, and I don't know if I just missed it, which is very possible all the time of the, the hints that were given through the pirate comic book and like the, how the similarities were happening. Like there was hints about Adrian because they like cut to him during one part and it's talking about like hidden things or doing things in plain sight and it's not actually happening, you know, stuff like that. So I think rereading it, I appreciated the pirate comic um, cutting in um, a lot more because I was watching for all the hints that I knew from reading it the first time, watching the movie, and I have to say, I kind of like the the movie ending better, where it's not this like weird, supposedly alien giant squid coming from a different dimension suddenly that unites the world, but the Dr. Manhattan being framed for it and just accepting it yep. and like, I'm gonna go hang out on Mars now and just being alone was, I thought, I don't know, I just kind of. So that's a great point. I'm glad you bring it up and I, and I wonder, um, do you think, is it realistic that that's what it would take, at least, especially in like 85, the, way, the Cold War between Russia and the US, is that what it would have would taken for them to come together, uh, an alien invasion, like something like off of the earth to do that, you know, to make that happen? Well, if Hollywood movies have taught me anything. It's that aliens unites the planet, finally, I guess. That's what, according to Hollywood movies, that's what finally unites us all. Whether yeah. it's, uh, uh, gosh, what's that recent one with, um, I'm not remembering any names right now. Uh, we have to figure out the language. Um, they come. Arrival. Creek, right? Thank you. Yes. You know, like Good that's, movie. 
Yeah. You know, that one I thought was good because it's like it unites us for a while, then our differences kind of like threaten everything again, but then we get united again. I don't know. So I, I think you're right that maybe that would be more of a uniter than like Dr. Manhattan's like killing a bunch of people and being framed, possibly. Um, yeah, I, I think dimensional squid would probably unite us a little yeah, it bit. Might, better. It might be because of the fact that Manhattan, you know, was, uh, you know, at least American. originally considered American. And so there still so would have maybe been this, can we trust him? And, you know, he, he ended the Vietnam War for us and all of that. So I, I don't know. I, but I get it. And I think the show, uh, the HBO show, 30 years later, does a really good job of playing with um, the squid ending of this one. And if you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. But it's really cool if you know if you know the book to see how they play with that aspect of it in the show. Um, I'm really excited to unmute Jeff Weber, calling in from Kansas City. You might remember Jeff Weber from uh, working for the publisher of Lock and Key. He used to attend our books and bars. Are you with us, Jeff? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm the long distance uh, call in tonight. So uh, this is kind of cool that even though we moved, I can still join in. Um, yeah, I, you know, and and yeah, through uh, IDW and Top Shelf, I've even worked a little bit with Alan and, and Dave in the past. But so I guess just my part of this whole thing is how much this whole book is just as much about the history and in, in a sense, an indictment of the comic book industry. Yeah, I mean, it's like, there's so many different layers here. And and yeah, I read it too. And I read it issue by issue as it came out in the 80s. And every issue was like one more thing. But, but you know, if you go through the pirate comics, that's those pirate comics in there are really, if you look back in the 50s at what was being produced before, um, before the Senate shut the comics industry down, um, that, that pirate comic is very, very close to what was being published back then. I mean, they were just that gruesome, just that creepy. Um, and even the, you know, the whole, the school at the end is almost a takeoff on the, the, after that period, you know, when there were the, all the 60s comics of, you know, like, Zumar invades Earth, you know, and all that sort of, a, um, you know, sci-fi stuff like that. But everything about this, and you don't have, you can appreciate reading it without knowing anything about the comics industry, I think. But if you know things about the industry and you know how comics are created and, and, uh, and how the pages are laid out and everything that, you know, design and everything, I mean, they manage to capture so many things about uh, the creative process The you know, like even, you know, it's all the little nine pound grids until you get to the, you know, when the, when the squid lands. And then when you opened up that comic back then, it was like, you know, what is it, like four or six pages that are just one continuous scene. So, you know, like build up that whole thing of all these tiny little panels and then it gets to the last issue and like, boom. Um, or even like when you were talking earlier about the color scheme, you know, it's a common thing. If you, if you look at comics, notice that all the heroes are primary colors and all the villains are secondary colors. So, you know, like the villains are purple and yellow and green and or, you know, orange and green and, and, you know, Superman's blue and red and yellow and Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, you know, so, so they're, they're just a, I don't know, there are a lot of things in there, but then even, then I guess I'll just, I don't know, Jeff, if you're going to get around to this, but how, um, how this book has played out in the industry, this was one of the very first, not one of the very first, but one of the biggest early graphic novels, um, once they compiled it all. And the, the contract that Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons had with DC Comics is that whenever DC quit publishing this book, they got the rights back and they could do whatever they wanted to with it after DC quit publishing it. Well, you know, to this day, it's a published book. DC never quit publishing it. So Alan Moore, like, completely burned all his bridges with the majority of all the publishers. You know, he you know, he, he won't allow the, the copies that are printed to this day to say his name. They just say, you know, created by the creator. He gives all the royalties, which are a huge, huge amount. All the money that comes from this book goes to Dave Gibbons. So Alan Moore won't take any of the money from this book. And he's, he was incensed that he never got the rights back. And he's incensed whenever DC and HBO and you know, all these people are making money and making new versions of what he considered his book. 
But then the last thing there is all these characters, when, when they started this book, DC had just captured the rights for Charlton Comics. And so all of the characters in this book are basically Charlton superheroes from the 60s and earlier that, that they just sort of filed off the names and changed them, you know, so you had the, you know, like uh, Rorschach was a, a character called, uh, um, what is it, not the shadow, but um, uh, the question. And, uh, you know, there are all these characters that, that he borrowed too. So, I mean, you know, it's just funny how there's a lot of irony on top of everything, in this whole thing. Um, so, I don't know. And it's Jeff, fascinating. And, we're, and Jeff, we're in a really interesting time, aren't we, that uh, a lot of us might not be as aware of, but uh, we're currently pretty much in um, uh, a shutdown. Of, of all of all of uh, regular comics. I mean, there yeah. of course, you know, a lot of things are shut down now, but um, comics are, are not really being distributed right now. They're coming back soon, but they've okay. been down for a while now. So no new comics have been sent to shops. And, and for a lot of people, I mean, every Wednesday, Wednesday is new comic book day. You know, you go right, to the store, then... you get them online and, and we've been without that for a while now too. Yeah, 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 it's, a, it's interesting times. So um, anyway. So, well, thanks for sharing, Jeff, and sure. good to see you. And, and uh, yeah, raise your hand again if you have anything. And now I have Caitlin here with us. Caitlin Fellows. Yeah, so that actually covers a little bit of kind of what I was going to say is that I actually really enjoyed reading this book. Um, it was at sometimes very challenging with some of the dissonance and not having that many characters that I necessarily love. Um, I really loved the framing and the movement that was created throughout this book. Um, I don't read a ton of graphic novels on a regular basis, but one thing that I really appreciate about them is that they force you to read in a different way. Um, because when you're reading through the action that's through the picture or the way the size of the frames or the way they're laid out, that forces you to kind of read with the movement and with the momentum that the author and the illustrator, the artist rather, are trying to capture for you. And so I really loved kind of the multi-dimensional elements that were added to this graphic novel that I think, you know, really true, really are quite revolutionary <clears throat> pioneering for um, many graphic novels. And, you know, with the, with the kid who was reading the pirate comic, like sometimes it was really difficult to force myself to read that. I didn't necessarily, especially given the context of the world, always feel like reading about a guy floating through the ocean on a pile of dead bodies. Um, but, you know, reading through that did add this sort of wholeness and this three dimensionality or even four dimensionality to the book that I really enjoyed. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a really, it's a really special book. And I think what a lot of people are picking up on is that there's a lot of dissonance created into it. And in some ways it's an incredibly dark book and in other ways, it's sort of put out as not. Um, and, you know, what I really loved about that dissonance was how it did challenge our perspectives and our notions and kind of questioning our ethics, you know, liking certain characters, but those are not the characters we should be liking. Um, and through that dissonance, it kind of challenges us to find beauty in some of the smaller, more kind of hidden nuanced elements of the book. And a lot of those really beautiful nuanced elements, I think, are in the art that's created into it. And I think, um, you know, some of the imagery there, not always the words, uh, but the way that Mars was captured, for example, in sort of this really beautiful regal type of way. Um, and it just really, you know, it, it built, somehow built in this type of realness that I think is often left out of superhero stories. Um, you know, I love kind of stories in general and the superhero kind of fantasies and whatnot and the optimism that's around them. But I think that added element of realness and dissonance and imperfection really captured this kind of new movement of superhero that what ha is kind of absent. And um, I really appreciated seeing that that new perspective, um, but especially the way it was captured through the art. Um, you know, we've picked up or mentioned many times from that by now, the use of secondary characters as sort of this 
symbolic kind of gesture of like, this is a new type of superhero comic. This is challenging your notion of what a superhero is or what your ethics are, what good and evil in the world is. Um, and I think one of the brilliant, you know, the brilliance of this book is really that, you know, it doesn't give us that black and white good versus evil. Uh, it gives us a more complicated, multi-dimensional picture at the world that there's never any true good, there's never any true evil, and especially in a time like this, um, you know, kind of that idea of even looking at ourselves and saying what is ethical or, um, you know, being able to find the beauty when we're constantly kind of trapped in this state of dissonance. Thanks, Caitlin. Brian. Brian, are you with us? Oh, my. Hi. How are you? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm well. How are you? Nice to see Good. you again. Um, I forgot why I raised my hand. That was a long time ago. But um, if if you've got that tally sheet, the for and against or pro and anti, I love this book. <laughs> um, I, I think this is the third time. I didn't finish it. I didn't get done today. Um, but this would have been, this when I do finish it, it'll be the third time. Um, I have the movie on right now, the Zack Snyder movie, because I love that movie. And the, the HBO show was great too, and I did get the tie-in at the end, which was kind of goofy. Um, but um, one of the things I really like about this, I just one element that I really liked uh, in the artwork, and I I really love the pirate stories because I love how they contrasted and they look like the old Archie comics, Ashley Cat. We used to read this kids, right? I had those too, I will admit. I had some. But they had that quality to them, that very dot matrix look um, to the way they were printed and stuff. And they did that uh, real well in this. And I thought that helped kind of uh, just give a balance to, you know, here's this other story going on in another way and watch all the things that impact and trickle into it from this old stuff. And the other thing about this book that I really like is, like I said, this is the third time. Every time I've read this, it seems like um, it just fits. Everything, maybe it's the timing of when I choose, but Jeff, like you said, kind of the political aspects of this. Every time I've read it, it's like, oh God, this can't be real, right? But it is. Um, so it's that kind of weird um, way it maps out to uh, to current time sometimes, or how it holds on and, and transfers from you know time to time too. It's kind of neat. So yeah, I I definitely got uh, a lot of different things from it reading it in the last few months versus you know when I read it two other times. I've read it. Um, I. I think it's something that um, you can go really deep or you can, you know, kind of just like some people have said, they skim some parts of it. You know, there's enough on the surface there, but there are hidden things, there are details, there are a lot of Easter eggs, uh, things to look at. Um, I was looking at some of the yeah. art. Um, there's a frame towards the end um, when uh, Vite says, I did it. And uh, his hands are up and it's, it's in a, fashion that really looks like um, he's like Christ on the cross and he's making like a proclamation oh, like yeah. it is finished and uh, and there's a, a video that I posted on on the Facebook page um, that's a watchman explained and a guy goes through with some panels and he shows things like that and shows some of the hidden hidden things um, there's a lot there so I don't want to you know bore you with all that that I learned from it but um, really cool stuff if you want to get into it so Brian thank you thanks for coming back and for sharing that with mm -hmm. us uh, Rebecca, you're with us. Yes, I am. Uh, and I'm also kind of like Brian. I've agreed with much of what a lot of you have said. Um, I, I, I did suffer through the women characters um, uh, just because I wanted... Mm, mm, I wanted them not to be better. That wasn't really the, but I wanted them to be relevant, I guess, in a way that I didn't think that, this is a very male-centric book, but 
Um, it's also a book of its time, but as Brian said, it's also a book that can speak to our times. Um, so in the end, I loved it. It was not an easy book, and it, and uh, I still actually have the last chapter to go. I mean, I did see the movie back then, though, so I um, knew kind of sort of where it was all going. All the characters' names were very familiar to me um, from my experience in, you know, and anybody who does anything with comics can't, um, uh, can't not know a lot about Watchmen. You know, the, the, it, has, it has really influenced uh, comics as much as Archie did, you know, in, it, in its own way. Um, I think that Alan Moore, for me, he actually sleep, seemed like the character Warshock and uh, kind of this curmudgeonly, don't give a shit, um, uh, can't though be distracted from the main point. I think a lot of the other characters um, were uh, less pure. Didn't mean that they weren't, they were probably better morally and all that other stuff, but Rorschach was pure. And uh, so I really appreciated thinking that that was Alan Moore talking. Um, you know, he doesn't have a real great opinion of, of people and um, uh, and that's okay, I guess. I mean, that's, you know, people do that. But anyway, so I just wanted to say, I, I think this book has a lot and I'm glad that um, I finally have read it and that uh, there will be the HBO stuff so I can get further into the whole genre or the whole, I don't know, culture of it all. So thank you, Jeff. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I'm glad you. I'm glad you got something from it. And um, we are having a little discussion right now in the chat about the way the women uh, were written. And uh, I just threw out there um, one possibility that uh, perhaps if we, maybe we're giving more too much credit, but are they written in a way that um, was a comic trope of the time? And he's saying something about that. I do feel that the HBO show does kind of course correct and uh, does feature women much more prominently and does pass the Bechdel test and, and does have much stronger female characters. And some of the characters are even from this story, um, like Lori, uh, the character of Lori, she goes by Lori Blake in, uh, in the show. And if you read the book, you know why at the end, why she might take that name. Um, I think she's a stronger character, but, um, I see some more hands, uh, and maybe it's about what we're talking about in the chat. If not, that's fine too. So, Kat, talk to us. Thanks for, I mean, I've always appreciated graphic novel months. Those are some of my favorites. Um, I will touch upon the comments on the uh, women characters. I understand the argument that, um, you know, that's how, that's how women were treated then and all that thing. But the thing that frustrates me is that that's still done today in books that you read that are published today. So that argument gets very tired when you read um, as a woman or when you read anything, because it's an argument that's thrown out all the time. Um, I did want to touch upon, um, as I do read superhero comics, I always appreciate, no matter what the art medium is, I always appreciate when something, it, something different is offered. And I think that um, what they did here was really great because a lot of us have mentioned that the superhero comic genre is very much about um, the good, the Boy Scout in case of Superman, like they always do the right thing, all those things. But the thing is, is that um, all your faves are problematic anyway. Um, you think about like Harry Potter and in the last couple of books, he uses the unforgivable curses. And in a lot of hero stories, we're always kind of led to believe that the hero does these bad things because they have a good reason and it's not really explored as to why the villains do things that are bad and that's bad. But when the heroes do things that are bad, that's okay. So I think this was um, a good kind of take on that about like how even your superhero people that you look up to can do things that aren't, um, that are morally gray. Um, I think the eighties were a heyday for a lot of really dark comics. If you think about the killing joke, which Alan Moore also worked on um, they were really unafraid, I think, in the 80s to kind of decampify comics in a lot of ways, which is stuff that we're still talking about to this day. Um, so I think there's a place for all of it, is I guess what I'm saying. So I appreciated it. Thanks, Kat. Um, you know, I'm reminded, so something I read that Alan Moore said was that um, we talk about 
you know, these, these uh, heyday of dark comics in the eighties. So dark Knight returns by, uh, uh, by uh, Miller um, it, uh, came out just a few months before Watchmen started. So they both were out in 86 and those two really changed things. And uh, Moore has said he feels that the industry got the wrong lesson. They took the wrong thing from it. And basically everybody made, Things super dark now. And we're still seeing that to this day, right? I mean, there's still these very dark post-apocalyptic kind of, I mean, for the most part, you know, what DC movies were um, up until, you know, the last few have been like that. Whereas Marvel tried to actually, you know, maybe lighten things up a little bit with their, with the MCU movies. Um, but, uh, but Moore has said what he was actually trying to do was um, show that reality um, presented that as a web of coincidences and chance occurrences and events and it's very non-linear and he was trying to reflect the way society um, was and the way things kind of just happened in the world and to reflect a complex reality um, that was really what he was trying to show and this is kind of what he said people didn't really get and instead they just took they just latched on to oh heroes are dark and dirty and evil and the world sucks and we're just gonna try to make it you know that even more, you know, darker than he did, kind of to, to one up him, which is unfortunate. Kara, I see your hand is up. I got you here. Um, yeah, so I mean, a lot of people have said kind of the same points about female characters um, that I think are a problem. I went through like in high school, like the first time I read Watchmen was in high school. Um, and I didn't love it, but I was intrigued enough to read a lot of Alan Moore's other works. And I don't think that he was making a point with his female characters, unless he was making the same point in all of his comics. Um, I think it was just like his, <laughs> he just didn't think yeah. women were interesting. Um, but I would make a plug that the TV show on HBO really redeems itself. Like all of the female characters are complex and really fascinating. And I loved it. So I think if you hated the comic book, you might still really like the TV show. Um, I also wanted to make a point about queer characters in this comic. Um, I found that really disheartening and really depressing. Like they use tons of blurs, which like whatever, we can talk about realism and how that's what the 80s were like, like that's fine. Um, but you have like everyone using them. Um, and then like the only actual queer characters we see are two uh, queer women who at the end of their life are like, one is trying to beat the other one to death. And then the only queer superhero we have was like murdered with her lover off screen. And I don't know, I mean, like you can tell me it was realistic for the time. Like that's true, the eighties sucked. They had another terrible pandemic in the queer community back then. But man, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I find it just very depressing. And I didn't relate to like any of the, the characters. Like, I guess I just don't relate to like the, the white men. <laughs> no, it's a fair point. And I'm, I'm glad you bring it up. And, and there are certainly things that, um, you know, uh, we might look, we look back at, you know, they, they're, you know, we see this a lot with, uh, with movies too, right? Uh, like I will, you know, it's like, oh, that was a classic. That's a classic of the eighties. And then you throw it on, you show your kids because you think, you know, they're going to love it. I loved it when I was their age. And then, <laughs> and your kids look at you, you're like, what did you talk? You talk like this? You know what I mean? Like, that's totally inappropriate. And you're like, yeah, um, yeah, that's not great. I shouldn't maybe, yeah, there's some stuff in here that you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, I mean, maybe Jeff Weber can speak to it more, but, and yeah, I, Ellen Moore doesn't seem like the kind of person I'd want to hang out with. Definitely. He doesn't seem like, uh, like we would agree on a lot of things. Um, you know, I do think he's a good writer, but I do think, yeah, he's definitely not perfect. He's definitely got his flaws. I don't know anything he's written more currently that maybe would show, you know, a more um, modern and enlightened uh, take on things off the top of my head. Um, I have read a bunch of his other stuff like Swamp Thing and uh, V for Vendetta and From Hell, but a lot of that is is from older times. And I, I don't necessarily remember how people are portrayed. The show does a better job of, of you know, of this also. I think the show, you know, of, of queer representation, uh, I think there's some um, better characters and, and more interesting 
things to see in the show. Um, again, I don't want I don't want to say that the show is better than the book or anything, but um, I would almost I'll say. say you, in the, well, in the chat, people are saying, you know, if we didn't like the book, should we do, or we didn't finish it, should we try the movie? I would say, honestly, try the show. If you, you know, you, Damon Lindelof, who did Lost, um, you know, with some other people. But it's kind of funny, in the book, uh, I didn't notice it until this time. It didn't mean anything to me. But um, Dan and Lori described themselves as the leftovers, which was a show that Damon Lindelof did before he did Watchmen. Um, so the leftovers that name may have come from Watchmen and there's another part in the book where they say we're lost which you know that's maybe a bit of a stretch but both lost and the leftovers are mentioned in in Watchmen and Lindelof has said this is like you know this is like his favorite thing ever it's like his number one um, piece of pop culture so he did a good um, job with um, the show I also just wanted to say I feel like it's ignoring something as well to just talk about women and queer people but race is also I think an issue in this book yeah. Um, it's just in terms of representation, and that's another thing that the HBO show is much better yeah. about. Um, Absolutely. But I will say, the only character that I think is, like, a good person is, like, the Black therapist in this book. Yeah. He's, like, the only one right. that's, like, trying to do the right thing and is, like, trying to, like, see good in people in this, in this whole book. Yep. Jeff Weber, we're back with you. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, again, it's, it's so much product of the early 80s, you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, that, that feminism, uh, LGBT, uh, um, race, everything, I mean, is, is a part of that, but, but all I was going to bring up is, if you want to look at other Alan Moore books, like you said, From Hell, um, V for Vendetta, were really big at this, came out at the same time, another one that came out at the same time was one called Miracle Man, which is kind of his take on the idea of what if somebody, it's sort of like a, a Dr. Manhattan, of, you know, what if somebody has basically limitless power, you know, what would they do with it? And that one actually has some strong female characters in it. And it also was the first, it was a completely uh, very graphic ver vision uh, or drawings of a woman giving birth at the time that came out in the 80s. And they had to um, sell the comic book in a plastic bag because they couldn't, have it have people opening it in comic shops. Um, another one though that he did later that is honestly is pretty much straight pornography is a book called Lost Girls that he did that his wife illustrated. And it's all the story of about uh, it's about Alice from Alice from uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, Dorothy from Wizard of Oz, and uh, uh, oh, and Wendy, Wendy. from, from uh, Peter Pan. The three of them have a have a have a queer relationship together, and it's extremely graphic. But it's it's kind of a very weird book. You know, it's like Alan's gotten weirder as he's gotten older. And I mean, if you see pictures of me, it looks like a caveman. You know, um, but then the other one that is fairly new is is a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which there was a terrible movie that had nothing to do with the books that came out. So don't don't ever compare it to the movie. But the the story is really good and. Uh, and it's another one where it takes apart basically every uh, historical comic book and uh, uh, science fiction and novels, you know, all through British um, literature. But, but anyway, the, the main thing there is uh, there really are very strong women in those books. So, so if you kind of watch the arc of Alan's writing, I think he's, he's very much moved to uh, powerful women that have a lot of agency in the things he's written over the past, you know, five to 10 years versus what he wrote back in the eighties. Um, but they're, they're all fun books to check out. If you have a chance to look at other Alan Moore books, um, they're all, they're all very dense writing, but, but they're, they're very different books too. So. Thanks for that, Jeff. I, I just listened to a rare interview with Moore talking about Lost Girls. Uh, he describes it as pornography, the, the one with, the, with Wendy uh, from Peter Pan and the one you just talked about. And I never knew this, that the name Wendy, he said, was basically invented by J.M. Barry. The first time it ever appears anywhere. It, it's, a, it's a derivation uh, of, yeah. of another word. And, but the name Wendy was created by J.M. Barry for Peter Pan. Huh, huh, yeah. That's one to grow on. All right, Ruthie. Hi, um, I'm here in San Francisco. I used awesome. to come to book to be able to come again.
We can't hear you. Ruthie, we can't hear you. You might be covering your mic. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. You can? Okay, cool. Um, yep. So, hi from San Francisco. I used hi. to come to Books and Bars all the time, so I'm excited to be able to come again. This is exciting. Um, I just wanted to give my reaction to the book from someone who hasn't really read a lot of graphic novels. Um, I think the first graphic novel I read was Seconds for Books and Bars, like a long time ago. Um, and so this one, when I started it, I kind of was just reading it um, as I would and realized I had to slow down and eventually was reading it like a poem, kind of. Um, like just really I had to take in every every scene every you know block of dialogue and once I started doing that it kind of meant a lot more to me um so I think I don't know if that's a comparison that's made in the graphic novel world but I I see it as a really kind of cool poem in a way um and also I see it as a timepiece for sure um, I've, my quarantine TV show that I've been binging is Cheers, which also is in awesome. the 80s and 90s. And so I think it was really easy for me to just see this as like, this is the 80s, this is the 90s. Um, not that it made it comfortable, but I did just kind of feel like, okay, I'm, I'm in a comic book. I'm in a graphic novel in the 80s. And like, once I kind of had that thought, I was able to just let myself go in it. So. Uh, thanks. You know, yeah, cheers. That's like a warm blanket putting that on. That would be, that'd be great for me. I'd love that. And someone yelled Norm in the, uh, in the chat when you said that. So, uh, great to see you again, Ruthie. I hope that you can join us more from San Francisco. You know, we're doing this twice a month, so you're always welcome. Um, thanks. I got Angela. Angela, you're with us. Um, did you get Peter? His hand's been up for a little yep. bit. Yep. And I did the thing where since Ruthie was a fresh hand, Peter had to wait. See how I was doing that? Oh, okay. And then I and then I let you skip ahead of Peter because you were okay. fresher than Peter. So, you, okay. so Peter want... Grady, Peter Grady is one of those stale hands that's been up before. So he okay. had to wait. Yeah, I wanted to classic. make sure. Yeah. <laughs> I <laughs> wanted... case of the old the, the old in person books and bars where you know <laughs> fresh hand. I'm looking for the fresh hand. So if you can okay. make your your hand a different color, that would be great. People, any of you uh, programmers out there, can change your Zoom hand. That yeah, it's gonna it's gonna pop up to the top. <laughs> Okay. Um, there was a lot of commentary in the chat around um, Rorschach's uh, character just in general. And I know we kind of talked about like the morality in that and it, all that conversation reminded me to go back and, and think about the fact that as I was reading his character at first, he didn't completely seem like he wanted to solve the problem and then he turned into the bad guy and then you see his backstory. And I, I tend to feel bad because they're like, oh my God, he was hideous looking. I'm like, I mean, he's not an attractive guy, but it's not like, you know, he crawled out of a cave unshaven, you know, and it was, it was just such a weird thing. And the fact that it started off with, um, you know, they tell his story about how his dad left and then he's being bullied and then he gets in trouble for like slashing or, or, hurting that guy's face or that kid's face it's like well they were picking on him they were going to beat him up and he's defending himself and the same thing once he gets in jail right he may have killed a bunch of people and that was pretty extreme but in the eating line the guy was gonna stab him and he killed the guy by throwing boiling water on him but he was gonna die if he wouldn't have done anything and then they came to his cell to murder him and then everybody's like mad because he killed people. I'm like, they were coming to kill him. So it's like eat or be eaten um, kind of a situation. So I, I feel bad because it's almost like he's got this cloud. Um, but yet he, he does seem to have that, that morality of like, well, if you're going to do bad things to me, then I have the right to defend myself. And it seems like he was, he was going to go tell on the guy that like, like killed a thousand people um, or 3,000 people, whatever. Um, because he knew it was wrong. You know, he didn't go out just murdering random people. He was trying to save people. So. Right. And it was 3 million. Yeah. And he, and he was like, no, I'm not going to keep this secret. Kill me now. And basically, yeah, he had a, you know, he, he's probably suicidal and had a death wish prior to that. Um, but yeah, it was like, um, you know, it's not a great term, but it's almost like 
um, that suicide by cop sort of thing where he, you know, he was like, make, he, he basically forced, um, you know, him to, him to be killed. Um, but yeah, yeah, he's not drawn in, a, in an exceptionally ugly way. I mean, he kind of is like uh, Ralph Mells from Happy Days or something, you know, he's just red haired freckled guy. I mean, he's really short. And the thing is, though, he doesn't bathe ever. And so you have to imagine, I think they talk about how he smells and, you know, he's wearing the same clothes all the time. And, he, you know, he was, he seemed like much more, you know, like a homeless um, probably type of um, character. And, you know, and you know, he's walking around at the end is nigh. I don't know at what point you noticed it was him who is the guy who's outside of the comics, you know, the newsstand with the end is nigh uh, placard. Um, yeah, I mean, he does, he is, he holds true to himself and to what he believes in and, yeah, and he pays for it. But um, yeah, anyone else on Rorschach, feel free to raise your hand. But, uh, but Pete, we got you now. We're with you, Pete. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm somehow Peter, but I'm, I always say like my friends call me Pete and then if I'm at work, they, they can call me Peter. But the, um, um, yeah, the, the Rorschach characters, he's, he's always been a real fascination for me because he's, um, uh, he, he's not the friend you really want to have, but he's, he's sort of like the homeless uncle that you're like, yeah, well, we, we, he's ours. And so we'll keep him. And like he, he always, he drives the story more than anyone else because everyone else is driven by their own things. <clears throat> and uh, he's the one that's driven by truth. And I, and it's, um, whereas the comedian I think is kind of uh, being uh, tortured by his, the guilt of what he's had to do. Um, Rorschach, I don't know if, if it was as much as a suicide as as it was a um um well yeah maybe because he, he can't live with a world with these people he trusted so much that they would do this and especially um how in the end he outwitted dr manhattan um at least in the movie but the um uh but uh it'll be interesting to see what the hbo series does with it but uh to Kara's point earlier, I mentioned it in the chat that it's worth mentioning is like, I work <clears throat> in the eighties. Well, there's a bunch of things, but I'll be quick. Um, in the eighties, I, I, um, it was unusual to have gay friends in the quantity I did. And, and you attended a lot of funerals back then, which is um, when I was living in the New York Philly area. And it's, <clears throat> um, it was a big secret and it was a real level of trust when someone would come out with you, come out to you. It's like, um, and uh, uh, my long-term friends are, uh, we always talk about how different it is now because it's, um, you, your livelihood, you would lose your job. Um, everything was on the line all the time. And so who you'd trust with that information was a big deal. And uh, to Kara's point about um, how uh, uh, queer people were dealt with, uh, we, we have so, uh, it's, it's better, but we have so much further to go in that, um, I mean, you don't, you never see a, um, well, you barely start to see him now, but not like what a person, what a queer person actually is today. So, I mean, um, uh, it it's a really good point, but it's also um, an interesting context too, because uh, a lot of the, my gay friends that are still alive, we, we were we were all bonded by comic books, so um, it was a um, it was always an interesting discussion point because, you know, we were always discussing, well, you know, was, Superman seems pretty gay actually, but the, um, uh, and other humor, but I'm, I'm sorry, I'm rambling on, but the, I, I think it's a great point to bring up that we, uh, Kara's thing is like, stop excusing that that was the era. And then like, yeah, it's, it's time to change things. So two cents. Thanks. Thank you. Brian's back with us. Uh, real quick, did we? Did you do this book before? 
Have we done no. this before? Not for books and bars, no. Did, did we do it in the comic book one? That uh, In one shot I, comics? I, uh, I, I'm not sure. Okay. That was it. Anyone, I just, if, the, yeah, if anyone else is from One Shot Comics here, I can remind us. I haven't been to all of them. I don't know if that's another club at Moon Palace. Um, I don't know if they did Watchmen there or not. I don't recall. Hmm. Okay. I was just curious because there was a real I thought deja vu feeling for you. This. Yeah, there was. It was. Yeah, and I thought well, Brian, you got, it's been you out since 1986. You 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 probably read yeah, it. I know. You know? I, so there's, there's I a did possibility read it, you remember but something. You, yeah. Yeah. There is. Odd, huh? Anyhow, move along. Nothing to see here. Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> I, I, I can only speak to, I know we haven't done it for books and bars before. And I can okay. find out about the other one, but yeah. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca. Just um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the comedian. Um, because yes. for for me, he was the worst character, and yeah, um, because he um, he could have been probably the best of them, but he didn't give a shit, and and so he mm -hmm. he did all the bad things and all that. He just um, and I I think when we were talking about the morality of the times, I think women's issues were starting to become a little bit more uh, something that you paid attention to, so forefronting the rape and the whole, uh, uh, you know, idea of that, that marked him forever as a bad guy, even though everybody else was, you know, murderers and all, et cetera. But um, I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't, it uh, wasn't deserved, but it was interesting how what Alan Moore did decide were things that were bad that they, that he would focus on and, and other um, failings that he would seem to, um, you know, n not pay that much attention to or not forefront. Um, I thought it was really kind of shitty to have him be the mother, the, the father of um, Laura and Lori. And that, that um, I wasn't sure exactly why it, it felt like it was just a dramatic flourish, um, you know, or maybe how, you know, screwed up people are. And I, I get it, you know, people yeah. are screwed up. But I, it, it, I don't know, it, it uh, didn't feel like that to me helped. <sighs> Um, yeah, anyway, and, and how about, and how did you feel then also about how um, Sally, like, was actually in love with him? Like, she, you know, it was, you know, even though she was mm -hmm. raped by him, she she still, like, loved him, right? That's kind of what I got from it. Yeah, it's effed up. Yeah. Katie. Yeah, so I want to go back to Rorschach. Um, I think his character is really like completely rooted in trauma and I find it endearing to a certain extent that instead of going completely postal all the time he tries to channel it in a constructive way I mean his mom was a prostitute he walked in on them like you know making a deal and wasn't wanted, you know, he was abandoned. And, you know, I think it came down to him to like survival of the fittest. And, you know, I got to take care of me no matter like what that boils down to. And like, and to a certain extent, like behind it all, I think he was, I mean, he was just trying to survive in the only way he really knew how. And like, in his mind, turn that into a productive and constructive way of like channeling those feelings, even though it doesn't seem right to us because it was really chaotic and cold and violent and um, not an approach that like any of us or most of us would really take in the world. And to him, it just seemed normal because that's what he just, I mean, that's all he really knew, right? Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting that he does seem to be the character that um, is talked about the most and, and resonates at least or at least gives us still something to chew on here. But I, I don't know if you guys get what I'm trying to say about, it, you know, how I think it, when you when you 
I don't know if you associate with Rorschach too much or you think or you think he's right you start to sound like now you're a conspiracy theorist or like an alt-right blogger or you know the kind of person who you know it thinks you know the joker was you know um was right you I'm know, a total conspiracy theorist so that makes sense it's okay <laughs> okay <laughs> uh there's some fun night owl being a dork talk in the uh in the chat and I got to say, um, one of the things I wrote in there, um, I really like uh, the character of Dan Dreiber, how he um, he writes that um, scientific article about uh, owls, and he kind of talks about how science um, has lost um, its wonder and how pe there's not enough romance and, and silliness and fun in science, and he wants to remind people of that. And it's kind of interesting how, you know, he's this dorky guy who is, like, he's impotent until you know they have like the costumes back on and they and they're becoming heroes again and they're on that tenement um situation and then in the movie they play the worst song choice for um for a sex scene they play hallelujah the jeff buckley song and it that's oh, not yeah. a sex song it's really it's really bad use of that song that song has transcended and is so useful in so many other contexts but it is not a great post superhero action scene sex song. Um, and I think that was a really bad Zack Snyder choice. Um, there's some really cool images and stuff in, it, in the movie, especially um, the way he deals with the opening and time and kind of like compresses things and shows us like the intro to the Watchmen. So if you want to see the Watchmen movie, like we said before, um, don't listen to the sex scene um, with the song. And, uh, but, but do think about bringing back wonder and romance. And, um, you know, if it takes us dressing up in costumes and going out and saving some people for the matches to be made here or show us your cats, whatever it works, but, uh, looks like, you know, you people, we're, we're trying, we're just trying. Okay, Rebecca, save us. Um, one last comment. Um, the little kid that was reading the pirate book, um, he was always juxtaposed with the news guy, Stan guy who was always giving kind of like a running a commentary on all the crap that was happening in the world. And that made me think of the, the little kids stood in for all the kids reading comics, obviously, who wanted to bury themselves in an alternate reality. Even if that reality was kind of like horribly awful, it still felt better than the, the thing. But the, the combination, I actually loved that juxtaposition. And the way that um, the um, artist and, well, Alan obviously allowed one frame to hold two entirely different narratives and not get us really confused, or at least once you got used to it, through stylistic preferences, font choices, color choices, all those things. I thought that was genius. Thanks, Rebecca. Angela's got her hand up now. I had to unmute myself. Um, okay. I want to make a comment to Rebecca about how um, I think she, weren't you the one that said as a teacher, you would uh, erase the, uh, the bubbles basically and have kids fill in what they thought the story was? No, was that someone else? Okay. Yeah, so oh, I remember that. Uh, someone did, I think they said that during lock and key. And so there was a point of time because I was not thoroughly enjoying this and got bored at one moment. I like stopped and then, like before reading it, I'm like, I wonder what this teacher means. And I made up my own story for parts of it. I know who it was. <laughs> um, yeah, it was our it was our St. Paul teachers. Um, mm. Yeah, it. Um, they yeah they were talking about how yeah they would show it and then have the kid yeah with a blank with a yeah. blank bubble and have them write the story. Um, yeah, I, I remember I, talking to uh, some people who um, would say, uh, oh yeah, I didn't, you know, I would just kind of, I didn't realize you had to like look at the pictures. I was just reading the words. I remember that blew my mind one time. <laughs> I was like, it's the picture is so much of the story. That's the point. I mean, I think if, if it's a story that can be told um, without the art, then it's it should be told in a different format. You know, I, I, the idea is uh, that the words and the pictures work together. And I don't know if, if you felt that way about this one, if you felt that the words and the pictures work together th with this one, but I was, I was hoping that you did. And I feel like, you know, we did hear some comments about um, Gibbons art and the coloring and stuff, but um, I, I want to talk a bit about the ending and how, uh, you know, the last line is I leave it entirely in your hands. And it's literally, you know, the journal, with the true story in is it going to be published or not what happens 
Um, and I think it's also, you know, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons saying to us, you know, this is yours now, whatever you, whatever you take from it. And people have been interpreting this quite a bit since 1986. Um, any thoughts on uh, what your takeaway is now that it's in your hands and um, anything else on the Watchmen? Raise a hand if you got it, or if there's something good I missed in the chat, feel free to bring it up to me. I think I just posted the info for our next one too. Did you guys get that? If not, here it is. That's our next meeting on the 27th. And it'll also be in the Facebook invite and in the newsletter. So we'll do it the same way. This seemed to work well. We didn't have any crashers and there was no one waiting to get in. You all pre-registered. So hopefully it was smooth for you guys. Um, does anyone else have anything else that they want to add? Um, any takeaways, anything else about Watchmen, anything? Jeff, I don't know. Yes. I've, I've only been doing books and bars for like the last two years. Um, I don't know his but I'm a comic book. You should find a comic book that's written and illustrated by women. Uh, a comic that's written and illustrated by women. Yes, so we did do, we have done one illustrated by a woman. You know, with Saga, it was by Fiona Staples. Yeah. I think she's one of the best yeah. artists in the biz. But yes. Um, Absolutely. Um, and feel free to send me some suggestions. I mean, I know some, but I've been trying to do ones that, you know, I think I've been kind of, um, I haven't really gone too deep or obscure. I think because of the fact that we're only doing one, I think I'm trying to pick ones that maybe people have heard of and might be interested in doing, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's a great idea. We'll find one for sure. Uh, my, my idea for next time, um, for next year already, which, cause it'll be another, it'll be sometime in 21 probably before we do it again, was to do Sandman because of the Netflix show. But, you know, we don't have to, you know, someone was saying it was no. too dark, so. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, is this what you, Brian? You is no. This you? <laughs> no I, what? You didn't, I thought. I thought I was on mute. I thought I was talking to myself. <laughs> How could you not do Sandman? Sandman's like the the pinnacle. There, okay. There were some comments. And I didn't know in the chat. I didn't know I was Sandman. Muted. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we have uh, Donna. You have your hand up. Yeah. I, before we close, I just want to mention that any of you that were involved in the. Uh, the, the last time we, we Zoomed, which was with J. Ryan Stradall, in his yeah. really thoughtful conversation about his book, um, Lager Queen of Minnesota, he recommended a book that I read just based on his recommendation. It's called The Wanderers, and it's just wonderful. And it's about a, a set of three astronauts chosen to go to Mars, but they spend 17 months in a simulation. And the perspective changes, a really interesting psychological look at female and male characters. And, you know, here talking about Mars and how it's portrayed in, in the book we just read. But just a lot about Mars, but it's really about people and what they discover about themselves, spending time together, which is ironically kind of interesting as we're all in quarantine. And so if you're looking for something just really, really interesting to read, do the Wanderers and, you know, straight I thought it was great. He's got a blurb about it. I thought it was great. So appreciate the recommendation. So awesome. Thanks, Donna. Yeah. And if you missed it, um, the video with Jay Ryan is up on the uh, Books and Bars Facebook page. Um, I cut it to just mostly just the Jay Ryan stuff and not any of my incredible technical difficulties and comedy that happens in the second, uh, in the in the last half hour but uh hey it's working tonight uh kevin you have your hand up i just have i have one quick carryover from the chat uh which is were there any other or two maybe two there was uh were there any other pets in this story other than the genetically modified links like i cannot i can't recall any um and secondarily are any of the books we're reading have we ever i can't recall us reading a book from like this from a perspective of a pet or a cat or a dog. Uh, those are my only two comments. That's what well, I got. Okay. Are you saying are you saying you would like to complain? 
I don't know. I mean, I could, I could, I mean, I could do it, you know? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, so first one, can anyone think of where, I, I know there was a genetically modified chicken with four legs in the restaurant. Um, were there other genetically modified animals or pets in this one? Let's see. Anyone? Um, how about, have we, is there a book we've read in the last 16 years that's from the point of view of an animal? You know, we read Rin Tin Tin, which was not from Rin Tin Tin's right. point of view, but it felt like it. It certainly felt like it. Um, let's see. Evelyn's got her, got hand, her hand up. Hand. Evelyn, talk to us. Hi. Um, that Matt Haig book wasn't part of it. He turned into a dog at one point, but maybe it's a human and a dog. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it's a human. Yeah, I think you're right. Which reminds me, there was a great, there's a great sex scene in The Magicians by Lev Grossman where they turn into Arctic foxes and, uh, and go at it. So um, if you want to read that, <laughs> another great books and bars pick. Uh, <laughs> Is it set to Hallelujah? By Jeff Buckley, otherwise I'm not watching. <laughs> yeah, I see that you like that, Brian. Is that is that your go-to jam? I is did. Your slow jam? No, no. I just thought that was a perfect song for that scene because <laughs> Dreesberg the dweeb finally got it, and he's singing Hallelujah. I mean, I, it was okay. perfect. So I hear that, but then but then I think it's it, then it's being like it's too over the top because you know. I know, it, but that, you think that, but yeah, I so, don't. Know. He 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 wasn't afraid to delve into the camp once in a while, even though yeah. you know. I mean, I I thought it was perfect. So yes, I did. Okay, agree cool. That. Okay, Sorry. that's cool. That's cool. <laughs> Kevin. Um, you... Oh yeah. So if you're. Oh, sorry, second... Ke... oh. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so um, books from perspectives of pets or animals. There's one. <laughs> Uh, there's one comic book, uh, there's one issue of Hawkeye that's told from the perspective of a dog. And I guess also a recent book that came out is from the perspective of a fox by Jeff Vandermeer, uh, Dead Astronauts, if you're looking for a more recent one. Yes, uh, yeah, that Hawkeye issue is fantastic, uh, told from the dog's point of view, absolutely love it. Um, highly recommend that, written by Matt Fraction, um, it's so good. It's from just a few years ago. It was a great Hawkeye series that I highly recommend. Uh, let's see, Evelyn, your hand. Evelyn, was your hand up or was that from yes. before? Yes, no, it's, it's up. I just wanted to mention before, um, I don't know if people mentioned this, but I thought there was a pretty strong connection with some of the themes of uh, the last two books ago that we read, the um, the guy who lived again and again and again. It was the thirteen the first fifteen, the first yes. fifteen lives of Harry August by Claire. Newell. Yes, um, because Doctor Manhattan right like speeds up technology like really fast um, beyond yeah. what the human capability of like finding moral or ethical boundaries around that new technology is so um and you can't really fix it like they can they're able to do in the other book um so i thought that was interesting mm. yeah <laughs> that's it thanks kara um, Ruthie just made a plug for it in the chat, but if you want books that are from the perspective of animals, Beasts of Burden, um, is a really good, uh, series by Evan Dorkin, and it's about, like, a group of neighborhood dogs, and it's like a horror series, so Jeff, it's right up your alley, because it's pretty dark. <laughs> I don't, you guys know that, uh, in my real life, I, I'm not very, I'm not dark at all. I'm not, although everyone thinks this, this name